There? OK. Um, who am I? I'm, I'm Jay Kwan. I started Tendermint in 2014 uh, under the company of All in Bits, and then uh, co-founded Cosmos. Um, wrote the initial SDK, uh, was founded the ICF, and then left. Um, coined the term IBC, so that's interesting. And then uh, since 2021, I've been working on this thing called No, uh, GNO. You can pronounce it however you want. Um, so what is it? It's a smart contract system. And I'm here in ETH Denver because it relates to Ethereum. And it's, uh, it's a solution to smart contracts that, uh, that is similar to Solidity, but you know, in better in many other ways. And I don't think there's much real competition in, in the way that GNO is offering to the smart contract space. So I hope uh, after the end of the talk, you guys get excited about it. Um, so we chose Go a long time ago, ever since Tendermint, because um, Go is a good language. And so why not have a smart contract system that is as easy to use or as easy to use as you know, Solidity wants to be, but completely based on Go? Right? It's an established language, and it's got some pretty good features. It's relatively simple. It's pretty important in uh, creating something that's intuitive. Um, it has type check safety, so that's good. It's what we need for uh, financial applications. I know everyone's excited about Rust, and you can write really fast things in Rust, but there's benefit to having smart and garbage collection in the smart contract language, right? Because it makes it more accessible to developers who aren't necessarily going to be your, you know, like backend core VM developers, right? But we want to bring developers into the ecosystem. And they probably want garbage collection. It's object-oriented, but it doesn't have inheritance. Inheritance. And I think it's a great thing. Um, if you haven't tried um, getting the sense of Go, um, I, I recommend it. It's, um, so inheritance, inheritance has this problem. I'll go into it in a bit. Um, Go does something slightly different. Everything is an object. You can embed an object in an object as a field of a structure, for example. And there's encapsulation, kind of very intuitive there. You don't have to learn this thing called inheritance. Yeah, so if you haven't heard of diamond inheritance problem, you know, it's a big thing. Um, Solidity, I learned, also uses diamond inheritance. Not surprising. Python uses it too. Um, Java doesn't even support multiple inheritance. inheritance. And, uh, and, and Go does, some, so, does something different. So anyways, combining all the features I mentioned before, you know, it, it appears to me like the ideal language not only for implementing backend services, um, like uh, consensus engines, but also even smart contract languages. <sighs> OK, so Go already exists. What's so special about GNU? Right? OK, if you write something in Go and you compile it, it gets compiled to you know, machine code or WebAssembly code. Um, but in general, it's not deterministic. So GNU, the virtual machine, is, is built to enable determinism um, all throughout. So the, and, and so in other words, the virtual machine was built for smart contracts, unlike um, Wasm. Wasm is another virtual machine, but it's based on bytecode. Um, and uh, it wasn't really built for the blockchain use case. So it's helpful, but you'll see that GNU has a lot of other features that uh, Wasm can't really provide. Um, everything's intuitive, and as intuitive as possible. I'll try to show what I mean. Um, but it's also got other features I'll talk about. Um, OK, so let's go over those. Why is it intuitive? Um, so here's an example. In the EVM, or in Ethereum, you write your Solidity code. Um, which gets compiled to EVM bytecode, which is uh, this other completely different construct, kind of separated from the language itself of Solidity. And then, and then it gets run in the virtual machine interpreter or the virtual machine, which is written in some other language. So you're not going to get Solidity, you know, as a, you're not going to get the EVM implemented in Solidity because it's not really built for that, right? But in GNU, First of all, everything is Go, right? Your program code is Go, your smart contract code. It gets 
um, parsed to AST, the abstract syntax tree, which is like the abstract f form model of the program. It's got if statements, else statements, branches, loops, the things that you learn as you learn Go. And the virtual machine, the GNU virtual machine, just interprets the AST directly. So you don't have to learn a new bytecode thing. Everything's Go. All right. Another reason why GNU is interesting is because there's auto persistence. And this is a really interesting feature that I haven't seen in other languages. But it goes like this. Usually, when you write a program in a language for Web 2 or Web 3, um, acceptance solidity, I suppose, you usually have to use a database. Right? You have to, uh, you get your object models, your logical models, your, the things that you're doing operations on, and somehow you have to shove it into a database. And then you have to choose NoSQL or SQL. Right? Um, and along the way, if you're using something like the Cosmos SDK, which I'll get to later, you have to figure out how to encode, decode these objects from the database. So there's like this distinction between what's in memory versus what's stored. Um, <clears throat> The GNU virtual machine, what it's doing, what it does is it, it, it gets rid of the need to consider persistence because anything that you construct in memory, such as new struct or even a primitive value like one, two, three, or a string, structures, everything in the language just gets automatically persisted at the end of a transaction unless it's garbage collected. Right? So it removes the need for databases or RAMs or even binary. <laughs> encoding, decoding. What does that get you? A different paradigm of programming, because nothing quite does that. And it also lets you express your logic in the most succinct way, because it gets rid of these concerns. Right? Also, I, don't, I didn't mention this, but um, supposedly HP invented memristors, and that's going to be a thing in the future, which is like RAM that automatically persists. Right? If that becomes mainstream, then I imagine our programming paradigm would have to change, too. Right? And here's a good way to get into that. OK, so not only does it automatically persist things, along the way, as it's persisting the objects, it merkleizes it automatically. Um, so what does that mean? I don't know why it says geo. Tree structure defined by user implementation. Right? So the structures, the data structures that you define in GNU is how it's merkleized which means you can define binary or 16 branching Patricia trees. Whatever you want, you just implement it. And, and the way it's implemented is how it's persisted and merkleized. What does that mean? It means the entire object state, the entire state of your program, your smart contract, can always be proven and seen by anyone outside. And so you can have a Merkle proof that proves that the state of a value in the blockchain is something. Right? And what that will enable, just as a side effect, is eventually we'll have IBC implementations in the smart contract itself, because you can do that. Right? If you can disprove the root Merkle hash of another GNU VM instance over there on that chain, then you, you can start experimenting with how to communicate between chains pretty easily. And you can go even beyond packets. You can just go to different different protocols, interchain protocols that just read state. You know, you can do different things there. OK, so I was mentioning that you can, along, you know, while I was mentioning auto merkleization, you can create your own data structures. Here's a, here's a really useful um, primitive tree structure that we provide. It's the AVL tree in GNU code. You notice it's got a left node and right node. And then it's got some other fields, too. Some of these aren't even are empty for inner nodes. My point is, you can see it's a binary tree. It'll merkleize in a binary way. Right? But you could also replace that with a Patricia tree, and you'll see 16. And, uh, and that's, that's how it'll work. So I'll give you more of a, an idea of what programming GNU looks like. I'll compare GNU to Solidity and GNU to the Cosmos SDK. Here's like the most simple contract you can write. Right? This is it. You can upload this just like you upload Solidity. You can't really do it on a Cosmos SDK. So here's uh, X. I'll try to do this. X is your, your 
X is your, uh, your state, right? And so this package is like your contract. And that variable, which is private, is your state. And if you call that exposed function anchor through calling a smart contract, and you can because it's exposed, then the, uh, the value will go up. So what does that look like in other things? Uh, let's compare it to solidity. It's pretty similar. So that's what I mean. GNOME is similar to solidity. But you don't have this in other smart contract systems, right? You got the package, which is called the contract. You got the variable x, and you have a exposed public function. Same kind of deal. So what's the difference? Um, well, the solidity targets the EVM. That's what it's designed for. Go is not. Solidity is still kind of actively evolving. And Go is too. But uh, Go before generics came in was pretty solid, right? Um, what's, what, and, and we don't have the EVM. No 256, 256 thing. It's just intuitive AST. Right? So, so that's the difference, I guess. Um, what else? Well, I, I, I don't know what it would look like in Solidity, but to, in, to import other things. Can you import other contracts by just calling them by some, in, some, some package name? Yeah? OK. All right, that's good. Well, you can also do that and go, obviously. Here's what um, something in Ethereum, ERC721, I'm sure you're all familiar with. You can basically express the same thing in Go, right? You got the same constructs already in Go. All right, so let's compare Gno to using Go in the Cosmos SDK. Here's the same thing, but you need a lot of boilerplate in the Cosmos SDK if you're programming in Go. You need. Um, you can use an autumn, you know, generation tool like Telescope. It's been building something along those lines. But you need like CLI tools. You need to message the transaction messages to clear somewhere else. And then there's a pattern of handler keeper, which is used to help keep the developer sane. Um, and then you've got this boilerplate code. So you notice here's the codec happening, the encoding and decoding happening here. And then you got your, your, your database system here. So you got all this boilerplate just to change one value, right? A lot more complex. Um, the reason why, well, the reason, yeah. You need, you need the GNO VM or something like it in order to get away from this and get into something like Solidity. What can you, so what can you build with GNO? Um, obviously, everything you can in Ethereum, I guess, more or less. But uh, the thing that I, we're really excited about is to go beyond. DeFi and to build uh, social social communication tools, right? So we have um, a demo, which is kind of like a Reddit clone. It's very early stages, but uh, here's one of the data structures from that thing. If you go to gnome.land, you can actually browse to find that board somewhere. Um, and here's a post or a comment, and you'll see that we're using the AVL tree quite a bit here, right? And uh, you know, otherwise it's pretty pretty understandable. Here's what it looks like. So here's the, the realm package path. Um, you can actually see the source. So I guess one thing nice about GNO is uh, you upload the source so everyone can see the source and there's no bytecode obfuscation layer. Um, what else? Yeah, so it's like these are the topics of the board. Here's a original post and here's a comment. Here's another comment, and it's just Go code. You know, where do you see that in Solidity? I'm sure there are, but is there anything like this, like a subreddit written in Solidity? Any names? Any? How do you spell it? Okay, all right. Well, interesting. Okay. Um, huh? Lands. Hmm. Well, it'll be really easy to do it in, in GNO. All you need to learn is go. <laughs> so go for it. Uh, um, so, well, okay, so some terms. What is GNO? GNO is the language. Sometimes I call it no lang. GNO land with a D is the blockchain, right? It's going to be a blockchain that includes the GNO VM and also is run by Tenement 2. It's another story. And, uh, you know, but the idea, 
is to make the GNU VM available everywhere so it can be run as a consumer chain even on the Cosmos Hub or even non-Cosmos projects, right? One of the things we're going to experiment with um, is a different license model. So we're going to choose, uh, instead of Apache 2, we're going to go with a copyleft system. So we're going to fork the AGPO li uh, um, license and then just make sure that there are slightly stronger attribution um, terms in there. So you, anyone will be free to create their own blockchain using the GNOME VM. They just have to give us attribution to sort in the form of link backs and, and, and other things like that. So that way, you know, we want you to succeed because if you succeed, we'll get eyeballs too. And I think it's a pretty fair system. And of course, your smart contracts, though, can be licensed however you want. So I'm just, this is just talking about the GNOME VM. Right? But otherwise, it's AGPL. I think that's what we need because um, we're, building, we're building tools to kind of change the status quo. And the status quo is using Apache 2.0 to prevent us from doing that. Another note about Plan 9. Um, so, you know, Plan 9 was this cool project uh, from Bell Labs in the 1980s. And uh, it was maybe like kind of like Ethereum before Ethereum, you know, Ethereum before blockchains, kind of. It's got this, this feel to it. Well, a lot of the people who were working on Plan 9 were the ones who created Go. So maybe Gno Lang is kind of like a Plan 9 extension or something, right? I'd say uh, it's a Plan 9 as a metaverse. So here's what I'm trying to say. I'm trying to say that Noland is the metaverse. <laughs> you, you got like Facebook you know, and everyone trying to create a metaverse and it's got like VR goggles and 3D. I, you know, I think, I think a, a metaverse is a virtual world, it's not, but it's not just a virtual world. If you just have a Web 2.0 virtual world, it's kind of boring, right? A persistent one would be one that's based on a blockchain, but what's the substrate of a metaverse? What should it be? I don't think it should be like two-dimensional land and 3D models, I think it should be based on logic and language, you know, together called logos, all right? So if you consider that, where's the metaverse? Ethereum is one, right? No land will be another. Just a random one for fun, I'm gonna propose the logos completeness theorem. It's kind of like the Turing completeness theorem, but the idea is that if you, if you have if you have a metaverse, you can simulate on top physics, right? You can use it to simulate physics and other, you know, using all kinds of decentralized means. And in there, you'll have intelligence emerge, and they will complete <coughs> the cycle and create their own metaverse and so on. And I'd say maybe that's what we're living in. Ooh. All right. So this is just kind of going over the same thing. Yeah, so uh, Plan 9 was, you know, Unix plus networking, right? Networking is pervasive everywhere. And we have IBC. All right. Here's a note on governance of no land. Um, I learned a lot by launching Cosmos, and I think there's this thing about tokens kind of like being a corrupting factor for projects because you get all the people who want to make money but aren't necessarily aligned on, on the principles or the values, right? So we're going to try to create no land to be something that um, is independent of financial fungible tokens for its governance. Even though it will have a fee token, it's not going to be the thing that governs what no land is. That said, because of the license model we talked about before, you can create your own no v, you know, no VM power chain that does whatever you want, powered by whatever token you want. We just want to make sure there's at least one blockchain that is independent of, of tokenomics for its governance and, and can serve as a kind of GitHub for, for all the other chains. OK, that was it. Um, that's no land. Um, here's some to do's. Um, and we'll go into Q&A, but uh, gno.lan, go there. When we launched Cosmos, we had this thing called the Game of Stakes. It was, it was pretty successful and a way to kind of bootstrap the community. And, we, and what that was was a lot of the community members became validators by running a, 
uh, um, their validator on the test net. So we're not, we're, gonna, we're not gonna have the same thing because the validator program problem is kind of solved, but we'll have um, another game where you participate by writing smart contracts or making contributions to the, to the lower stack, the no VM or Tendermint 2. Um, so uh, it's gonna be an ongoing program. Eventually, you know, uh, uh, Game of Realms will really be on when all of the UX is running on our smart contracts and we're finding new people and evaluating their contributions through the DAO, right? So that's, that's the end goal. So please go to No Land, and if you have a new DAP you want to build, try building on, on Go. Um, yeah, follow us on uh, Twitter, GitHub. All right, that's it. Let's go to Q&A. How about that? Thanks. Yeah, so in the presentation there was a focus a little bit of like Go versus other languages and basically like how we can easily deploy uh, probably even like a new app chain, correct? Mm -hmm. um, so in fact, two things. One, why did you choose to compare to Cosmos SDK rather than uh, Cosmosm? I mean, you know, on one hand side we have smart contract platform like Noland and on the other hand SDK which is more like um, deep, let's say this way, right? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so that's one. And the second is more about, um, uh, okay, user base. Yes, how you wanna get, get the user base. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, so I'll try to remember in a second. I'll, I'll start with the first. Um, so Cosmwasm is like, I guess I guess the reason why I didn't compare it to Cosmwasm is because um, uh, Cosmwasm itself isn't the language. It isn't the actual uh, language. Neither Solidity. Neither, well, Solidity is the language. It's the language that the smart contract developers are programming in. Uh, custom, oh, okay, virtual machine. Okay, so let's, so let's say like a Rust over Cosmwasm. Sorry? So let's say ca uh, Rust, Rust right, over right. Cosmwasm yeah, yeah, yeah. rather than comparing to the Cosmos mm. SDK. Yeah, yeah, okay. So um, that's, that's a great one. And um, I, I actually want help from someone to figure out what, you know, like the, the, the Cosm, Wasm, Rust analogy with the X example. It would be good to see that because I, I don't know. Thank you very much, yeah. Um, and and um, so one is because I don't know what it's like, but also um, I'd say uh, the way I see GNO in, in juxtaposition to other Cooperative competitive products is that it's based on the language itself. I think that um, there there will be um, um, a smart contract system based on Rust, and it'll probably be Cosmosm based, or it might be something else. But some you know there's going to be an excellent thing for Rust, uh, and but that will be its own ecosystem, just like Rust and Go compete, but they also kind of don't. People who will like Rust go towards Rust, and they don't want to touch Go, and vice versa. You know, so um, well. Next time I'll include a, a slide on Rust, but um, let's say uh, uh, you know, I don't know. It's just it would be a bit bigger, but not that much. Yeah, yeah. It's 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 like the garbage collection aspect, and the the I, I know that it's got a really powerful way to manage memory, and it's unique. There um, is. Yeah, and and I think it's really cool too. Um, I just never got around to learning it myself. Yeah. But that said, doesn't mean it's not going to be a successful product. Yeah, yeah this, the second was about the user base. The user base, um, yeah. So uh, I mean both dev and uh -huh. and non-dev, like. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, it, it, I think I don't know. There's it's somewhere between DeFi and social applications. Like, like. I believe if we have, we can demonstrate a killer product that's fun and engaging and, and viral, and you know, will probably soon happen soon after the, the chain launches. Um, more people will come and see how easy it is to fork it, modify it, and I think that'll be maybe the way that we'll get developers on the smart contract side. And then, um, you know, yeah, so we'll see. It's either that or funding more DeFi apps, and I'm sure we'll do some of that too, right? If you look at the Game of Realms program, um, the kind of contributions we're looking for are broad. 
There's so many categories. You don't even have to be a programmer. There are some categories that don't even require programming. And uh, yeah, DeFi and social networking apps are, are all things we want to see contributions for. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, there's a question here. Hey, uh, sorry. Um, so, um, in terms of the in terms of the um, social media aspect, um, how are you how are you solving the? Uh, I, I think that uh, crypto has a very hard problem of like gas and um, onboarding. So, how 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 do you solve the onboarding uh, with gas fees or even like uh, social media with gas fees? Because uh, I feel like that could be kind of antagonistic, gas and social media. Because you have to pay for every transaction that goes on chain. Yeah, yeah. So maybe maybe it might be good for some social media kind of like applications, but um, like compared to the status quo, it kind of adds that extra yeah uh, barrier. Mm -hmm. That's true. Um, I guess uh, you know. I mean, uh, I guess you can mitigate some aspect about need need to pay by integrating a wallet to it, but that's still kind of kludgy. There needs to be something to solve that problem. I totally agree with you. Maybe, maybe uh, some way to sign up to a service that will help pay for your um, most of your your your, you know, maybe like a subscription service or some other thing. Hopefully not ad based. Yeah, I, I was actually thinking yeah. of um, like perhaps dedicating part a part of the block um, incentive. So like maybe uh, ten percent or whatever percentage of the block incentive to. Uh, validators uh, or proof of stake validators, maybe I'm not sure. It's a, it's a problem I haven't really solved. And uh -huh. <laughs> <Warning>. <laughs> okay, well, imagine the chain will want to say like, not necessarily to a validator, but to some other service that helps sign on and onboard users, and is part of like the strategy for getting users onto the platform. And there can be many competing ones. Each one of those could have some kind of subscription so that they have free some space allocated in the blog. That certainly seems possible. Yeah. Um, the other thing is needing to sign every message. Like, who wants to really use their thing, every comment, right? You know, yeah. That's something we can solve in the wallet, though. So, you know, um, some, that's something to fix with, uh, you know, permission models, right, in the smart contract system. Yeah, I think ideally, like, you know, when I pay for something, like, it's kind of like, oh, I have it on my phone. So, like, if you can sign something, you can use your face ID or some biometric that's locally stored. Maybe that might. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Um, yeah, I, I don't know much about how to integrate biometrics well, yeah. but yeah. I mean, that's that's another thing is um, beyond the social apps, we need a way to get one person, one representation somehow, yeah. right? Because then you can get both governance, local governance, and UBI, and better airdrops. You know, uh, you can so solve so many other things, but in a way, it has to preserve privacy. Right? Mm -hmm. So we'll need some way to, probably some biometric system will be involved somehow, but still it needs to preserve privacy. And I'm not really yeah. sure how to do that. <laughs> yeah, but hopefully <laughs> you can write it in GNOME. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> okay, and then we'll go to the other side, yeah. So uh, in no land, what I am like, understanding is like you'll make a whole ecosystem mm -hmm. by like writing codes on codes in GNOME. And I like the part where you said that all the data would be merkleized so that it's very easy to verify data stock data on another chain. Mm -hmm. But what I see, like substrate was there before, fabric was there before, like on like separate silos of blockchains. Mm -hmm. But ninety percent of everything is happening on Ethereum right now. Mm -hmm. And to bridge assets so that like we start making something in no land, but there are a lot of assets on Ethereum and if you have to migrate users from Ethereum to no land. We have to find a better m way to move assets to no land also. But Solidity doesn't suppose that Merkleized proof thing. So, do you have anything in vision where you can have a good bridge between no land contracts and the Solidity contracts? Um, <clears throat> I mean, besides, um, I know there are some bridge projects to bring Ethereum assets to the Cosmos ecosystem. Yep. Um, beyond that, don't know what we can do at the moment. Yeah, I, I was looking at the game of rims and all the projects that you have. Like, there were a lot of for documentations as well, like for non-programmers. Mm -hmm. There are a lot for like 1155, just uh, like 
three weeks back 1155 was introduced in no land and like it's it's catching up i could see that mm -hmm. but to move assets and move user base from ethereum to no land we like we should have something so that people can easily mi migrate to no land mm -hmm. it's very simple to write contracts in this as mm -hmm. compared to solidity i can see that mm -hmm. yeah um well please help us <laughs> um yeah well and also yeah maybe yeah I, I don't know i don't know to what degree we need that as a priority but certainly it's interesting and something that would help so yeah that sounds exciting um we'll go go there to that side and then we'll come back to this side. uh what's tendermint 2 and how's it different from the current version of tendermint okay um tendermint 2 um is uh so tendermint 2 forked tendermint before a lot of the things that used to be amino encoded became protobuf and um and 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 because the, the one of the one of the philosophies of tendermint 2 is to go all in on amino right to use it across the whole board and there's a whole another slides that I should have for amino. I can go over some of that, but that's kind of besides the point. There's also a lot of simplifications, um, like changing the, the, the asynchronous pub subsystem, removing the indexer to a simple way, a synchronous, simple synchronous event switch. And then the idea is to make it kind of like a microkernel so that other indexing systems have to plug in, right? Um, so in, in short, the, the core philosophy of Tendermint 2 is to keep dependencies minimal and to make it much more of a kernel than any other project is, than Tendermint Core is. And probably then Comet BFT will be or anything else because it's, it's, such, it's, it's like the primary motive. The, um, the reason why is because, um, well, the thing with open source projects that, that like are you know, foundational or is infrastructure or whatever, these open source projects tend to get political, right? Like people want to contribute and add features because they want to, but also it gives them like uh, goodwill associated through having contributed. And, and generally people want to put their, their you know, design vision into a product, you know, when, when they join a project. And, and um, you know, I, I don't think that can be solved unless we start adopting the mentality of here's a named product Here's the goal, and then it'll be done within you know a number of years, and then that's it. It's it is what it is, and I think that's what we need in order for it to be uh, um, a good standard for um, not just running on production, but also educational purposes, and um, ensuring that we have some secure, proven product that doesn't get politicized. Um, so that's that's another thing. Um, yeah, keeping the um, dependencies minimal, making it a micro kernel or, or more of a kernel than anything else. Uh, going all in on Go and uh, and, and and Amino and, and if you go to GitHub slash Tendermint slash Tendermint two, there's a readme with some of the other changes too. Yeah. Okay, just a random question. Like, um, uh, when does um uh uh. Uh, garbage collection garbage collection happens and you know like um if I want to wanna make sure they uh, some uh, the, the struct to be um work as like a study one like um uh, storage and uh keyword in solidity is there any something like equivalent in you know um so uh, I'm I'm not exactly sure how the solidity one works but in short um the so every every package um. A stateful package is called a realm, right? Because it's got data and it's realm, but it's a package. And and uh, you saw var x, which is a variable of that package. So anything that is uh, indirectly or directly attached to a package is persisted and not garbage collected. Everything else is is garbage collected. Um, there's uh, there's some caveats because there's more work we need to do. Um, right now the thing works, but it would be even better if we included a synchronous garbage collector, really technical detail, which is in our roadmap. Um, there's a thing about cyclic dependencies. Um, and uh, I think the way to solve that is actually to kind of 
turn it into a market so people can say, here's a cycle starting from this object ID, and then you can navigate it. And then if it actually is a cycle, then you know, remove it and reward whoever discovered it. You know? um, so uh, I hope that helps. Yeah. Hey, Jay. Uh, for the validator sets, what's the plan for Nolan? Like, are you going to use ICAs as well on the slide? Or are you going to have your own sovereign set? Yeah. Um, so uh, we will have, um, uh, we'll support both. So the license model for the GNOME VM, it'll be AGPL, and, uh, but with strong attribution. But otherwise, anyone's free to create their own under the AGPL license. Um, so, uh, and, and we will, we will also work on an IBC integration with GNOME VM and Tendermint 2. So it should, you know, we'll make it so that it can run as a consumer zone on the Cosmos Hub, right? But also, um, you know, on, on the GNO land chain itself too. How does that work? Like right now, the the engine security module is a Cosmos SDK module. So how how would that work with uh, Nolan? Uh -huh. um, well, the, the consumer chain doesn't necessarily have to run SDK. Um, you know, we'll see. Depending on how ICS is implemented, um, we can still have the provider chain run the SDK, but uh, it would be good if, uh, if the consumer chains can run other things, right? So we'll, we'll try to make that work. Are you, are you already working on that? Um, we're uh, in the early stages, not not quite there yet, but yeah, it's on a roadmap and we'll ramp up. So what's uh, what's the timeline for Nolan? Um, uh, well, you know, uh, I've learned my lesson there. <laughs> but uh, can we expect this this year? Uh, yeah, yeah. If it's not, I'll shave my head. <laughs> <laughs> And so also, I saw uh, IBC2 on, on, on one of these slides. What's, uh -huh. uh, what's IBC2? Yeah, the, the, the concept is that because in the GNO, everything is Merkleized, um, you know, once you have, you know, uh, just by using IBC, you can prove the state of any variable or anything, any object in, in the GNO VM. So that opens doors for anyone to permissionlessly create IBC protocols just in the smart contract layer. So I'm just calling that class of things IBC2. You know, if it's a different smart contract system, you know, maybe it's IBC2 slash Cosmosm, IBC2 slash GNOME. Yeah. Uh, hi, uh, I have two questions. Uh, within the GNOME VM, is the operand like low-level operations that is where the GNOME is being compiled and interpreted? So. I think it is parsed, but yet it is interpreted into the low-level operations, right? Um, can, can you repeat that? Maybe. Yeah. yeah. <coughs> so the GNOME VM would have their own set of operations, and once the interpreter parses and like compiles down into those low-level operations, the VM executes those operations. Is that right? Kind of. The low-level operations actually are discovered during interpreting by looking at the ASD. I'll show you the machine mm. if I can if I can get the uh, internet access here. Oops, sorry. It's okay. Okay, it's it's all right. We don't need to do that. We don't need to do that at all. Okay. Um, yeah. So uh, it's a stack-based virtual machine. Mm -hmm. And um, there's several types of stacks. There's the expression stack, statement stack, value stack, and then there's um, some other things too. But like the things that are in the stack are like AST elements themselves. Uh. And then, um, and then there's there's also an opcode stack. The opcodes stack is uh, every opcode is just one byte. So there are there are yeah there's there's many operations. Which are yeah, that that operate on the AST basically. I see. Uh, the reason I ask this is that uh, I think GNO will have a great impact on smart contract system inside of Cosmos ecosystem. So, if the operations and the VM architecture is somewhat like more low level and much more detached detached into the from the Go GNO Lang uh, AST, then I was thinking about it, would it be possible like to compile other languages? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. Yeah. Great question. I think it's a great idea to fork the GNOME VM or to find you know, you know, uh, soft fork ways to extend it to support other languages. I think it's a great base 
or other languages to compile into. Yeah, then, then you'll have all the features I'm talking about in your own language. Yeah, go for it. And the uh, second one is that while I'm looking into the GNU VM code, I found out there is a channel uh, syntax that is available. And do you have like any plan in the future that you're going to implement some asynchronous call or asynchronous data transaction that would be possible like a send a data or function call across IBC or something? Yeah, yeah, um, absolutely. So um, it, when we launch, we're not going to have Go like concurrency. So you won't be able to use channels at first. Um, but uh, yeah, the plan is to implement um, deterministic concurrent channels. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, any, any other questions, guys? Yeah, well, maybe it's time to get drinks, okay. Oh, no, 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 Can we do, uh, uh, like, Alchemy University, something uh, to learn uh, GNOLAND uh, for a developer uh, with a good resolution video to learn? about uh, for developer uh, can we, uh, is uh, web3 javascript can uh, work with the, uh, with the gnoland you know web3 javascript it's web3 uh, javascript yeah it's uh, tools uh, ethereum tools for de developer uh -huh. so to to connect uh, to make the work uh, easy uh -huh. for solidity and and the question is Will can, we can we, uh, it will work on GNOLAND with developer tools for Ethereum. For Ethereum? Oh, can, yeah. Can we work on GNOLAND? Yeah. You know, I, I think the, probably, a, especially at first. What, what uh, is the developer tool for uh, GNOLAND? Uh-huh, uh -huh. okay. Um, so we're, uh, a lot of, okay, we try to keep a lot of the things self-contained so you don't need a lot of tools. For example, like, if you go to gnome.land, you'll see a link to view the source of a smart contract. But if you also hit help, you can see like how to use the CLI to upload a smart contract and interact with it. OK, but that's just like base tooling. We're also working on a GNOME-specific um, wallet to help make it easier to upload smart contracts and call it. Um, you know, there's, there's plans to integrate it into uh, um, the uh, Emeris wallet extension. Right, so we're going to continue working on the Emerge wallet extension, and part of what they want to add is uh, GNO integration. We're also working on an, an IDE. Um, so someone in our team is working on um, a GNO IDE, so it'll be kind of like a portal to, to test your development and upload smart contracts there. Yeah. You mentioned the token's not going to be a governance token, so I was just wondering if you had a um, kind of further thought out how governance would work? Yeah, that's a really good question. It's something that we're still having conversations on about. Um, so here's an idea. Okay, so we, we kind of know that we want levels of members. And at the top, we know that we want as many people as possible that are experts in enough of the stack, have made enough contributions, and also um, have like core value alignment, right? Um, and so that's really the goal. And then there should be levels underneath it. We know that you know a lot of the people who come into the Game of Realms program, we want them to come in as entrant members. And then there needs to be something in between, right? So how many levels are there? What do the rules look like? Another thing we discovered was, okay, well. Maybe, you know, let's say there are like seven levels. And first you come into level one. And we know that we probably want to try an experiment where level two can self-select members. And then we'll see how that goes wrong. And maybe level three be different, you know? Um, so we'll, we're still thinking about it. It's really open space. We don't know how to do this. There's a lot of experimentation that we need to do. Um, and uh, eventually, you know, even no land will fork and there'll be different diverging visions, right? So we want to probably want to bake in some forking ability too for the member set. Yeah. All right, man. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I think it's time to get drinks again. Thank you very much. Thanks for coming.